Hey everyone, today we are looking into the life of Donna Maria Emilia, a member of the deposed Orléans royal family of France, who went on to become Queen Consort of Portugal. Although she is an obscure figure today, she holds a significant place in the history of Portugal, as she was the country's last queen. This is her story. Maria Emilia, or Amélie, as she was more commonly known, was born on the 28th of September 1865 in Twickenham in London, England. Her parents were Prince Philippe of Orléans, the Count of Paris, and Marie Isabelle of Orléans. Her grandfather was Prince Ferdinand Philippe of Orléans, and her great-grandfather was King Louis Philippe I, the Orleanist King of France from 1830 to 1848. His reign ended as the French monarchy had been overthrown in a series of revolts which had swept across Europe in 1848. Thus, when the Second French Republic was established at that time, the Orleanist royal family had headed into exile, and it is for this reason that Maria Amélie was born in England. Her early years were spent in exile there, but in 1870, Napoleon III of France, who had become president of the country in 1848, and later made himself emperor of the French, was overthrown. Then, following French defeat in the short-lived Franco-Prussian War in 1871, a third French Republic was created. As a result, six-year-old Amélie and her family were finally allowed to return to France. Her father, Prince Philippe, hoped to press a claim to the French throne again one day, but this never proved possible. The family split its time in the 1870s and early 1880s between Paris and an estate in Normandy in the north of the country. She was an intelligent teenager as she grew up, reading extensively, particularly about French history and archaeology, and also poetry and fiction. As was still typical of the upper class in the late 19th century, she learned Latin and also some German. Amélie also became a keen drawer and painter. With their return to France, and the lingering possibility of a restoration of the monarchy in France, if only in a purely symbolic role, Amélie became an attractive marriage prospect for Europe's royal houses in an age when the continent's royal families were all enmeshed through complex marital bonds. Thus, in the mid-1880s, as she entered her adult years, a marriage arrangement was concluded whereby Amélie would marry Carlos, the Crown Prince of Portugal, and heir to his father, King Luis. The wedding was celebrated on the 22nd of May, 1886. Unlike many such marriages, there was not a major age difference. She was 21, and he was 23. On her wedding day in the Portuguese capital of Lisbon, Amélie wore an elaborate decorated mantle, or flowing gown, which had been gifted to her for the celebration of her nuptials by the city of Paris. It was fashioned out of rose-coloured velvet and lined with silver embroidery with phytomorphic motifs all around. The edge was also trimmed with satin frills. Amélie would only wear it again on two further occasions, when meeting Pope Leo XIII in Lisbon in 1892, and when celebrating the 12th birthday of her eldest child, Luis Felipe, in 1899. It remains part of the Portuguese crown jewels today. Their marriage would soon result in children. Luis Felipe, the Duke of Braganza, was born on the 21st of March 1887, just 10 months after their marriage. A daughter, Infanta Maria Anna, was born prematurely on the 14th of December 1887, and died in childbirth. Their third and final child, another son named Manuel, was welcomed nearly two years after that, on the 15th of November 1889. King Louise died prematurely on the 19th of October 1889, when he was just 50 years of age. As a consequence, Carlos ascended to the throne just after his 26th birthday, becoming King Carlos I. Amélie now became the Queen Consort at just 24 years of age. By now, she was beginning to acclimatise to her new homeland. She had arrived a young woman who didn't even speak the language, 
but by 1889, her Portuguese was sufficient to converse freely with her subjects. However, she did find court life with its formality and endless ceremonies oppressive. There were troubles beyond the overt formality of the court. Portugal had once been a proud imperial power which had punched well above its weight on the world stage, by colonising Brazil, parts of Africa, and carving out a trading empire at strategic sites across the Indian Ocean. But those days were long gone by the late 19th century, and Portugal had become one of Europe's poorest countries. The loss of Brazil and other large overseas territories was only barely compensated for by the acquisition of new colonies in Angola and Mozambique. However, efforts to carve out a continuous corridor of land across the breadth of southern Africa, the so-called Pink Map Strategy, were ended soon after Carlos and Amélie came to the throne. In 1890, the British issued an ultimatum whereby they effectively commanded Portugal to stop acquiring land in Africa because it would likely get in the way of Britain's ambitions to form a continuous colony from Egypt all the way south to the Cape of Good Hope. Back home, Carlos and Amélie were also unpopular owing to the failure to industrialise the Portuguese economy and the reliance on agriculture, shipbuilding, fishing and other types of unprofitable economic activity. The people of Portugal remained generally poor as a result, and the country declared bankruptcy twice during Carlos' reign. Amélie also had to contend with marital trouble. Carlos was a serial philanderer who engaged in multiple affairs during the 1890s and 1900s. Amélie consequently found solace and meaning in charitable work. She studied medicine for two years at the Chola Polytechnica in Lisbon, a decision she claimed to have taken in order to treat Carlos's health problems from his obesity. But in reality, her medical attentions were focused on establishing hospitals and treatment centres for patients suffering from tuberculosis, a terrible disease which was ravaging the poorer parts of Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These included a sanatorium for children who had developed the condition, and also a clinic to offer palliative care to tubercular patients who were nearing death. By the mid-1900s, the unrest within Portugal had increased into outright political tensions and protests against the government and the monarchy by republicans and socialists. Terrorist organisations such as the Carbonaria had been stirring up hatred of the crown and the media had become increasingly vocal in their criticisms of Carlos. It was surprising, given these tensions, that when the royal family were returning to Lisbon from the Ducal Palace in Alentej on the 1st of February 1908, they were not accompanied by any major security detail. This lack of protection would prove fatal. When they passed through the Tejero de Paz on the riverfront of Lisbon, two Republican agitators, Alfredo Luís da Costa and Manuel Buica, opened fire on their open-top carriage. In the resulting spray of rifle bullets, the king was killed immediately. The royal couple's eldest son, Luis Felipe, was also mortally wounded, and he died about 20 minutes after the shooting. Their other son, Manuel, was hit in the arm but survived. Amélie was the only member of the royal family in the carriage not to be shot, despite the fact that she had tried to cover Manuel who was in any event hit in the arm. She even battered one of the gunmen with a bouquet of flowers she had been holding when he climbed onto the side of the carriage. Thereafter, the two assassins were killed on the spot once the limited royal bodyguard responded. But it was too late. With the spray of bullets near the River Targus on the 1st of February 1908, Amélie's husband was killed and she ceased to be the Queen Consort. Thereafter, her 18-year-old son became King Manuel II of Portugal, yet the country would never know another queen. Unfortunately, Manuel's succession did not bring any stability to Portugal, rather, it compounded the instability. As little more than a teenager, the young monarch lacked credibility and maturity, at a time when the country needed a firm hand to steady the ship. 
It was made clear to him from the very start that he would not find allies amongst the increasingly powerful Republican faction. As one such individual, the anti-monarchist journalist Joao Chagas warned Manuel, Your Highness arrives too young into a very old world. Nevertheless, Manuel advised why his mother did try. He nominated a consensus government which included monarchists and republicans. Legislative elections were called for in April 1908 to try and quell the public unrest, but none of it proved sufficient. The economic crisis continued, and with it, the political instability. The end of the monarchy and the Braganza line of Portuguese kings finally came in the autumn of 1910. On the 3rd of October, a rebellion broke out in several locations around the country, and spread quickly the following day. The Portuguese military proved reluctant to obey orders to suppress the insurrection. For instance, the civil police and the fiscal guard simply stayed in their barracks, rather than move against the political agitators. On the evening of the 4th of October, Manuel and his mother were consequently advised to temporarily leave Lisbon before the royal palace was stormed. This was the beginning of the end. The following morning at 9am on the 5th of October, a Portuguese Republic was declared from the balcony of Lisbon City Hall in the centre of the capital. By that stage, the king and his mother and their followers had boarded the royal yacht Amelia, named after the former queen. Initially, they planned to make for Porto, but when they learned that Portugal's second city had also joined the revolt, they realised it was futile. Accordingly, they set sail for British-held Gibraltar, and from there headed into a life in exile in Britain. In Lisbon in the aftermath of the October Revolution, a provisional government was formed, led by Teófilo Braga, a leading Republican, and in 1911, a new constitution was approved, and with it, the first Portuguese Republic came into being. In the aftermath of the October 1910 revolution, Amélie and Manuel headed for England and took up residence in Twickenham, where Amélie had been born in exile as part of the former French royal family. This must have made her one of very few individuals who ended up living in the same place in London 40 years apart as a result of a royal family being exiled from two separate countries. In the first years of their exile, there were several conspiracies launched to try and restore Manuel to the monarchy in 1911, 1912 and 1919. From exile, he and his mother supported the Portuguese entry into the First World War and requested that the monarchists back in Portugal refrain from any efforts to overthrow the government during its duration. Following the war, and the one further brief attempt to restore Manuel again in 1919, he and his mother accepted the reality of exile. Consequently, the 1920s were lived quietly, and Manuel died suddenly and prematurely of suffocation from a tracheal edema in the summer of 1932, at the age of 42. Amélie spent much of her later years in France, her ancestral homeland. During the Second World War, she was invited to return to Portugal to live there, but other than a brief visit in 1945, when the war ended, she lived out her remaining years in France. She died there on the 25th of October 1951, at 86 years of age. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Donna Maria Amelia, I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life down below in the comments, and if you have any suggestions, also leave them in the comments. I hope you guys are subscribed and have notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. That's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.